Gang, 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 welcome everybody. We're gonna wait a couple minutes before we get started, allow everybody to trickle in as much as possible. So no worries, we'll give just a minute or two, but you can see the attendance is popping up very quickly. How's everybody doing? I hope you all had an amazing day. I hope you had an awesome kind of Friday, right? Today was pretty much a Friday, uh, you know, relative to the market, right? So this is our Friday as traders. Woo! It might not be your Friday overall, depending on your current job situation. Uh, but I hope everybody is having a good pseudo Friday, I'll call it, a good pseudo Friday. If you wouldn't mind, if you are an attendee, I am going to go ahead and be turning off cameras, but if you wouldn't mind turning yours off if it's there, just because it uh, having other people's cameras on slows down our bandwidth. Um, so if you don't mind having your cameras off, and I think everybody should be muted, but I'm going to go ahead and make sure that participants cannot unmute themselves. Awesome. All righty. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Again, like I mentioned, we'll wait just a second before we get truly started. I want to allow people to trickle in a little bit as much as possible. I don't think we're going to have any issues with the live attendance numbers. Uh, I think that most people who sign up uh, might not be able to have made it in time. But um, as mentioned, so again, I'm just going to mention this one more time as people come in. If you are on, please make sure that your video is turned off just because it slows down our bandwidth. Um, but I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to do a webinar. It kind of hit me that I hadn't done, it, it was this back and forth decision I had had, right? Because I haven't done a webinar, a free webinar since, a, a, I mean, I don't know. It's been at least six months, right? The, uh, we did the charity webinar in December, which wasn't free. People, you had to pay $20. We donated that $20, which was amazing. We were do, able to do something really special for Feeding America. Um, but before that, I hadn't done a free webinar since like May. So it had, all, I honestly think it's almost been like a year since I have done a, a totally, webinar. So I had that kind of angel on my shoulder that was like, yo, you got to do something. You got to put something together that out there that anybody can attend, that can have the recording and kind of help anybody who's struggling at the moment. And there was the other side of me that was like, Jake, being a content creator, as much as it might seem like an easy job at times is really hard. And I've done a bunch of podcasts recently. I've given a bunch of psychology speeches recently. So the other part of me was like, Jake, how much more do you have on psychology that you haven't told people. Because one of the things that is a pet peeve of mine is when creators attend, uh, invite you to webinars and then give the same webinars over and over and over again, right? Um, and so my goal is to, I don't like to do that. I don't like to give a lesson that I have already given. My goal with each free webinar or charity webinar, or whatever the case may be that I do, is that I teach you something new. Because all the old ones, while they're not immediately available on YouTube, are available on YouTube eventually. So now my charity webinar, Previous psychology stuff is all available on YouTube at the moment, right? So there is plenty of stuff that some live attendees may have already seen. And some of you who found me even more recently have had the opportunity to go back and, um, and watch, right? So the goal for me is to give you all something new with every presentation that I do when I do a free webinar, I guess, and make it so that the value is like unmatched, right? That's my goal of all this is to give you some walk away from the experience where you're just like, damn, I feel great about that. Now, like I said, the last time I done a genuinely free webinar was back, I think it was like literally almost 12 months ago. And the subject of that one was also psychology. And in that webinar, we covered something called the loop. Now, since that webinar, I have not formally talked about the loop in any capacity, whether it be a mastermind class, whether it be in uh, like the Discord trade reviews or YouTube video, I haven't talked about it. Right, so I have breached this subject before, but I've never given an in-depth presentation on the fundamental flaws associated with it. And I figured today would be a great day because the loop is all about starting with selling a position early. And I have a feeling that today there are quite a few people who might find themselves in stage one or stage two of the loop where they're possibly even have gone through the entire thing today, right? where I could potentially save you a big headache on Monday when the market comes back because you'll be aware of how to handle your emotions a little bit better, right? So I've talked about the loop before, but the title of today's presentation is like the loop on steroids. It's the ultimate addition, right? Like imagine that 
you played, you know, a, a game that was crappy or it was mediocre, right? It was solid at the time, but then the ultimate edition comes out and it's just a whole nother level. That's what I want today to feel like. We're going to go through the loop and it's very basic principles in the which I taught in it before. And then we're going to dive a deeper level than I've ever gone on it and talk about the fundamental flaws that I believe are associated with each stage of the loop, how you can try and avoid those, how it can potentially save your trading psychology, how you can avoid the deathly cycle that ultimately comes from the loop. We're going to then review some other trading psychology advice that I have given you and how ultimately kind of tie this together as my ultimate trading psychology presentation. And then the last thing that we're going to do is take a dive into the charts and talk about how all of this could have played a role in today alone, right? And that is uh, something that I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about. So I got a text from somebody who's on my team and I want to make sure that there's no... Uh, Issues, okay, they're just saying they love me. I love you too, but that was a scary time because I wanted to make sure nothing was wrong. Um, but that being said, let's go ahead and uh, and dive right in. Uh, I actually, sorry, I got a message from my other team member. I want to make sure that there's no panic. Okay, all right, perfect. We are good to go. Let's talk about the loop. Uh, someone's asking to record. Someone was trying to record that locally. I had to deny that request. Just as a reminder, the recording will be sent out to every single one of you who is here. So no worries. Don't worry about that recording it locally. You're going to get a nice email from me with the recording, right? So first, for those who don't know what the loop is, right? I've, again, I've talked about this before, but the last time I did a webinar on this, I had like 8,000 followers and now I have significantly more than that. So I have a feeling I'm talking to a little bit of a new audience. If you are an OG though, from back in the day, make sure you post something on your story and let me know that you're like, a real old follower because it will mean a lot to me, right? But the loop is one of the most dangerous things in trading. And ultimately, it is a way that most people blow their account, in my opinion. I believe that most blown accounts come from some sort of original tie back into the loop, right? So the loop always starts with one specific thing that happens, right? You create a trading plan or you follow a signal, whatever the case may be, you take a trade. You enter the trade, and as soon as you enter that trade, the first thing that you do is whether, let's say you're on Thinkorswim, you enter the trade, you're watching on your computer, then you pull it up on your phone, you got your Thinkorswim on your desk, mobile on your phone, and you're just watching that P&L. As it goes up a couple bucks, you're watching it. As it goes down a couple bucks, you're watching it. As it goes up a couple bucks, you're watching it. And maybe you've had a tough week the week before. Maybe it's been a long few days. Whatever the case may be, you're watching your P&L, and once you hit a certain dollar amount, right? You make the executive decision that you're going to close that position. You're over it. You do not, you could not fathom seeing that $150 that you were up, go back to zero or go back or give any of it back. So you sell and take profit, ignoring your trading plan, ignoring your rules, ignoring what you were initially trying to do, essentially just taking profit on that trade because you were up for any number of dollar reasons, right? That leads us into stage two of the loop. Stage two is my least favorite of all the stages, TBH, but this is the part where you watch that trade that you closed early run without you, right? Maybe you had a plan to buy NVIDIA at 265 or something and sell it at like 270. And instead of doing that, you got scared at 267 and you closed your position. So then you watched your options contracts run another 200%, whatever the specific number is, without you, right? The process of watching that position take that toll and make that move without you is going to cause you some psychological distress just by watching. One piece of advice I have is don't watch, get away from the screens, go occupy your time and mind by doing something else. However, most of this, us as human beings do not have the strength and ability to not check what a contract is at after the fact. You know what I'm saying, right? Like I, I, I wish that I had that power, but truth be told, I don't. Now, I don't check it as often as other people, but if I exit a trade early and it runs massively without me, you bet your ass, even if I'm away from the screens, even if I got bad service driving through the hills of Montana, you bet I'm going to be loading up to US seeing what that contract went to at some point. As much as I can try and tell myself that I don't do it or I don't do it often, I still do it. And it's still something that I believe it's, it's hard. It's in human nature, right? And this is going to take a huge toll on your trading psychology and the mental capital that you have to exert on trades because it's hard, right? It's hard seeing the fact, especially with the way options work, there are times where many of you might have sold a position for 50% profit. And as amazing as that is, that trade ultimately ended up running for like 600% profit. 
And 600% profit would have doubled your account. Doubling your account would have changed your life, whatever the case may be. It's hard to deal with, right? It's very, very tough to deal with. And there's no doubt that stage two is the catalyst, so to speak, or, uh, of the ultimate downfall that comes from the loop, right? It really is those emotions that you start to feel and deal with as you're going through the loop, right? That start to wear on you and then play into your next decision-making processes, right? Which leads us into stage three of the loop. You take a new trade, right? That trade goes against you, but you are, you're not thinking about that. You're not thinking about how much you're down, right? You're not thinking about anything like that. The only thing that you're thinking about is that the last trade that you had, two things happened. One, you sold early, which sucks. But the thing that sucks more is the second thing, which is that you sold early and you were still right. You were still right, right? You closed your position and that made that move without you. And then instills this little false sense of confidence in you and then carries over into your next trade where the mindset that you have is, no matter what, I'm going to be right. The last one, not only was I right and I made money, I was so right that it went more without me. So there's no chance on this one that I'm so wrong that I, I won't make money. It's just not going to happen. So you ignore your stop loss. You let it trail down, right? For an even bonus position, right? You could potentially, or if you're looking to get some extra points in jeopardy or whatever the game might be, right? For the ultimate tilt moment of stage three, possibly you oversize that position as a whole, right? Because you wanted to try and make up for the lost amount of profit that you saw in stages one and two. The other optional stages of this trade is that you completely rushed into it and it's over planned, right? But the worst part is, is that once the trade proceeds to tank and ultimately you decide that the dollar value loss is too big for you to sustain, right? And you have to cut the position, you're down 50% of the account, whatever the case may be, and you close that position. Right now, the kicker, and this is optional, this doesn't happen during every stage three, but oftentimes what will happen is that you oversize that second trade, right? That stage three trade, you oversize it. So the drawdown that you feel forced to sell because your dollar value loss is too big actually isn't the chart, what the chart is telling you to sell. It isn't your plan stop loss. You only sell because you're down too much. You're only down too much because you oversize. And then as soon as you stop out, the trade actually continues to work without you and all you had to do was one, not take that trade or be a little bit more patient for entry or just not oversize it, right? Now that's a little bit of a kicker, a little bit of bonus points for stage three, but I can promise you all of us who are here right now, if you're here attending a trading webinar, I'm assuming that you've been through stages one, two, and three, you might just might not know them by these names, right? I have a feeling that every single one of you has experienced this at one point. Or you're a completely brand new trader, which let me be the first to tell you that you are going to experience this at some point in your life and in the near future. It's unavoidable. This is, this is, this is part of life as a trader, right? So stage three ends, whatever, however you got there, you ultimately end up taking that loss, you close your position, and it's way bigger than you initially anticipated, right? Now, stage four, and it doesn't always go straight from, a, uh, from you finish the trade in stage three and then immediately get to stage four. Sometimes you could take three or four trades all while being in that mental framework of stage three, where you just continue to take big loser, big loser, big loser, big loser, small loser, medium loser, whatever the case may be. It might be death by a thousand trades, right? Where you just take the small loser, small loser, small loser time and time again. But what will eventually happen, because even a broken clock is right twice a day, whatever that saying is, right? Is eventually you will enter a new trade and it will start to work, right? Now, whether it's a planned trade, whether it's an unplanned trade, whether it's a good trade, whether it's a bad trade, these are all factors that I can't tell you right now because they're situationally dependent. However, you enter a new trade and for whatever reason, it starts to work and it starts to go in your favor, right? From there though, I originally thought this was a typo, it's not. Not after being scared from the last trade, after being scarred, from the last stage, right? After you are scarred from the last stage, you ultimately end up watching the PL on that trade. And because you're like, man, I took such a big loss on the last one, I just need to lock a winner. Green is green. I just need to lock. I 
just need to lock a winner. I just need to lock a winner, which isn't a bad mindset in theory, right? But when you're stuck in this loop, it can be the worst decision that you make because as soon as you close that position, right? It can, again, typically will start to run without you and continue to work to the target that you had if it was a planned trade, right? Now, this should sound awfully familiar because ultimately what stage four is, is a reincarnation of stage one. Right. The difference is, however, though, is that in a stage four, you're coming off from being scarred from the previous trade where you did take a big loser. Right. And that is what ultimately impacts your decision making on why you exit. Right. Now, the loop itself that we just talked about. Right. The loop itself is something that I got mentioned. I presented on before. Right. I presented on that before. But that's all the depth that I've gone into it, right? From there, I normally have talked about how detachment is a big role in getting over the loop and how if you're stuck in this, the only thing that I would recommend in the intermediate, in the uh, like immediate term, excuse me, is a break from charts, a break from trading and a break overall, right? But like I mentioned before, I don't like to do these webinars where I'm just giving repeat information. So Today, what I decided to do was do a deep dive onto the loop, and I want to identify the fundamental flaws that come with each stage of the loop. Because if you know the loop, right, if you know what the loop is and you are aware of it as a whole, right, it's then easier, not easy, but easier to notice that you're in it, cut yourself out and get out of it, right, aka take a break, right? However, what that doesn't do is it doesn't fix the underlying psychological issues that caused you to start getting in the loop in the first place. So in order to do that, we have to take a deeper dive on the loop than we ever have before and talk about which particular parts of trading psychology each stage is affecting. Once you become aware of what parts of your psychology are being affected in that stage, if you can identify that, hey, I'm in stage one right now, I just sold early, then you can start to think, okay, this is what I need to correct. This is what I need to change. And if I can't, I got to get the fuck away from my charts, pardon my French, because I'm about to do something stupid, right? Sorry, it's really hot in here. And turn my fan up. Uh, right? So with that being said, let's go a little bit deeper than we have before and cover what exactly I believe the fundamental flaws are with each stage of the loop, right? So first, as we mentioned, is the initial stage where you create a trading plan or you follow a signal, whatever the case, you enter the trade, and you ultimately close it early. Now, what we talked about is, is I pulled my phone over and I said, hey, you look, you were looking at TOS staring. I know, many, I know how many of you have done that before. You're watching your charts on the screen, but what you're really doing is you're looking at your TOS p &L. You're not even really watching the charts. You're staring at your phone. You're staring at it. Just like, what's my p &L? What's my p &L? I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up. And whatever the case may be, you make the decision to close that position because you don't want to give that dollar back, right? Now, there are two fundamental flaws that I believe come with this stage one of the loop. First is being greed, right? Inherently, there's an element of greed that's going to come along with stage one in the sense of this idea of selling early, early means that you made a wrong decision, right? You, you think that you, in your head, you're telling yourself that you were wrong. I sold early, there was something that I could have done to extract more, right? You could have done something to extract more out of it. However, the reason that greed is not the main fundamental flaw for me of this stage is because ultimately the real flaw that you are exhibiting in stage one of the loop is dollar-based value, dollar value based decision-making processes, right? AKA you are making your decision-making processes off of a dollar value rather than off of the chart, rather than off of your trading plan, rather than off of whatever the case may be. And anybody who has been trading for long enough knows that even though it might sound ironic and backwards and, and, and sound crazy, right? Even though it might sound and, and trip you up, one of the things that you have to do as a trader is not think in dollars, but think in process, think in R multiple, right? Think in the different alternative ways to dollars so that you're not just watching, making these dollar value-based decisions. Us as human beings are not trained to do well in trading as a whole. We're way less likely to succeed when we are constantly thinking of dollar values because when we see dollar values, all we see and think about is what can I use that for in my real life, right? As soon as it becomes a dollar value as opposed, and I don't even like percentages, truth be told. All I care about is R, 
right? Which is how much your, your R multiple, AKA what were you risking and how much are you up, right? But as soon as you start to see it in dollars, it starts to become a whole different part of equation, right? It's whole, it starts to become, okay, what can I spend this on? What can I use this for? How impactful could this be on my real life? And as soon as you're making dollar-based value decisions, right, dollar value-based decisions, ultimately your logic is going to be flawed. Your execution is not going to be on point the way that you want it to be, right? So stage one of the loop is you enter a trade, you close it for whatever reason, most likely because you're P&L watching, right? And the main fundamental flaw from stage one is this concept of dollar value-based decision-making. You do not want to be making your decisions on a trade based on the dollar value behind it, up or down, right? Of course, you do on a max risk, right? You want to make sure you're flying your max risk. But even that, right, it should be thought of in R multiple. When I'm down one R, when I plan to risk, that's when I'm out of my position, right? So again, fundamental flaw from stage one is basically thinking and making decisions based on dollar value rather than based on the chart or based on your R multiple, right? Now, stage two that we talked about is my least favorite stage, that stage where you close the position up or downside, you watch it run to your target without you. Again, the example we used, and I'm just spitballing here, is maybe you took an NVIDIA 265 bounce. You thought the stock was going to bounce at 265. You went long with a target at 270, right? But somewhere along the way at like 267.5, halfway there to your target, Price action scared you out and you got out of the trade for whatever reason, right? You then watched it make that move without you, that oh so painful Friday zero data expiration move. And all of a sudden a trade where you made 50% on could have been 350% and account changing for you had you just helped. Again, my least favorite of all the stages is this one right here. This is like trader hell, right? Seeing this, the emotions that come along with it, right? Like this is the really really difficult part of being a trader, as I'd say. And still to this day, it's one of the things, now I'm pretty good at it. Now I'm pretty robotic that these things don't really affect me anymore. But in terms of like, oh, selling something early doesn't affect me too much anymore. But like I said before, I'm still going to be the person that no matter where I am, if I sell something early, at the end of the day, I'm checking the options contract. And whether I want to or not, at least once, I probably do that math, right? Of how much could you have made? Anybody who tells you they don't do that math at least once, I think is lying most of the time. Or they went out and did something where they like, you know, they were drink, they got drunk, or they took their mind out in the sense where they literally couldn't do that math. You know what I mean? Uh, but again, like we talked about, this is the stage that really sets most people up for their ultimate downfall, right? Because this is where you start to have that depletion of mental capital. This is where you start to exert and you you it becomes one of the most frustrating things of all time, right? Now, there are two big fundamental flaws that come along with stage two. First is developing a recency bias, right? In uh, the worst part of all about watching that trade one without you, like we mentioned, is not only did you sell something early, but you sold something early and you were right, right? You were correct about what was going to happen afterwards. And that is inherently going to give you a recency bias on your next trade. Your next trade, whether you want to think about it or not, right? If you had something happen to you where you sell massively early in one trade, on your next trade, there is going to be this unconscious level of recency bias in your system, right? Where you're starting to compare what happened on the previous trade going into your next one, right? So again, the goal of finding these fundamental flaws from each stage is to find the flaws and find the character traits, so to speak, that we have to correct. And having recency bias in any portion of your trading is ultimately something that's going to come back to bite you in the ass, right? What happens today is doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. What happens tomorrow doesn't mean it's going to happen the next day. What happens the next day does not mean it's going to happen a month from now. Trading is crazy. And while there are patterns, while you can start to develop, see trends, right? See consistent things, right? No two trades are equal. And just because something happened in the last trade does not mean it's going to happen in the next trade, right? I think that's a very key and important thing to kind of take away from stage two is you need to make sure that that recency bias is being kept in check, right? All right, pardon me. I got to get my new LaCroix. Oh, a better flavor on this one. So this was my favorite uh, slide from today, the one of, of the recent grade, because I've talked about this idea of Pokemon theory before, not Pokemon theory, but I've used a quote 
from Pokemon several times. And there's been some lines in the past of my career that I have taken from other traders and credited them or whatever the case may be. This Pokemon line one was mine, right? I've always, this has always been one that I've created, which is that trading is ultimately not Pokemon, right? You're not going to catch them all, right? So Pokemon theory, I believe, starts to stem from stage two, right? Or stage, stage two of the loop that we've been discussing is the most, it's so really easy to draw a parallel from that into this concept of Pokemon theory, right? Pokemon theory is that once a trader starts trading, they have the desire to start treating trading like Pokemon in several different aspects, in several different ways, right? First is this concept of trying to catch them all, right? And this is the one where I've kind of had this famous line where I'm like, this is not Pokemon and you will not catch them all, right? Meaning that there are several thousand high quality trades that occur on any individual given day. Some days there might be far less, some days there might be far more, but on average, I bet if you looked across all the stocks, across all these various different strategies, even if you hone down to one, there's going to be a few high quality trade setups every single day, right? Now, Pokemon, the entire concept of it is that you have to catch them all. You gotta catch them all, right? In trading, it couldn't be further from the truth, right? Not only do you not have to catch them all, but you don't have to capture the entire move. And that is one of a fundamental flaw that traders have is feeling like if they, and, and I'm going to tie this back to the loop in just a second, but feeling this need that if a contract went from $1 to $7, that you were not only have the opportunity, but you kind of feel like you, you were owed to capture that whole move. It's this like almost level of arrogance to the sense where once you see it happens, subconsciously, we start to think that we are like, it, that should have been us. Like, like we should have had that, right? Like that should have been ours. And it's fucked up that it's not ours, right? Like that's how our brains start to work, right? And so this idea, right, in the loop where on stage two, you let a trade, you close a trade and then it continues to run massively without you, right? All of a sudden that starts translating into this Pokemon theory, which is a fundamental flaw of trading where you start to think I was entitled. That's the word I was looking for, not arrogant. I was entitled to capture this entire move, right? That was something that I was entitled to capture. Not only am I trying to capture all the moves that are occurring each day, but I'm trying to capture every cent out of each move. There is no way to drive yourself crazier as a trader than try and catch every move that happens and try and hold for every dollar of that move, right? All you're doing is ending your putting gray hairs on your head early and giving yourself one of the most stressful careers, adding stress to what is already one of the most stressful careers out there, right? Now, the last aspect of Pokemon theory that I like to touch on, and it doesn't necessarily relate to the specific Pokemon video game because there is no like high score in that game, but in all video games, right? And even in Pokemon, there is this option to like restart right? There's this option to restart. And if you're comparing it to trading, that option to restart would be reloading your account, right? And in theory, and, and again, most, some people don't listen, but in theory, everyone who starts trading should at least have the ability to like, you, like, like everyone preaches, that shouldn't be your last dollar in your trading account, right? So in theory, everybody goes into trading with this, whether they are willing to or not, there's this, again, subconscious mind that's like, the ability to restart is there. It just comes with another deposit, right? And so once you start to treat trading like a video game in the sense of trying to run up a high score, subconsciously your brain starts to think it's okay. If I die, I'll just restart in the video game, right? If my account is blown, eventually I'll just reload, right? I'll just put more money in. I'll get another paycheck from work, right? I'll put this on the credit card. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And next thing you know, right? All you're trying to do whenever even you're making money is play a video game. You're not really trying to trade. When you're making money, you're just trying to reach your, get your account to a high score. Maybe you're just trying to recoup back any of the initial money that you deposited and ultimately have lost, right? Whatever the case may be, rather than trading the way that you are supposed to, right? You are treating trading like a video game, right? Again, this entire Pokemon theory in my eyes stems from stage two. It stems from like the wandering eye, so to speak, of when you enter a trade, you close it early, and then the stage two of you watch it run without you. Again, it's one of the most brutal and most difficult things to see and deal with as a trader. 
And I believe that it contributes to these two fundamental flaws, the recency bias, and then everything that comes along with Pokemon theory, trying to catch them all, trying to capture the whole move of the next one, right? Trying to think that the next trade that you're going to take is going to be the same one as before, and it's going to run your account back to the highest score of all time, right? This is a fundamental flaw, a psychological flaw that comes along with the stage two hell that it is, right? So we've talked about Pokemon theory. I, and here I said the solution to Pokemon theory. We're going to tie everything together sort of at the end on this, right? Um, and talk about tips to get out of the loop as a whole. So uh, stay tuned. I meant to delete that portion because it felt out of place, but here we are. Right. Uh, so now stage three, let's move on to stage three and the fundamental flaws that are part of stage three. Right. So again, you just left the stage two. You just left where you watched a trade run super hard without you after you've exited. Right. So now we're entering stage three where you take that new trade. Right. You take that new trade and you have that subconscious feeling of recency bias and Pokemon effect where once your trade starts to go against you, you say, no, 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 no. I'm going to ignore my stop. I'm going to ignore my risk on it, right? I'm right, right? And I'm going to capture this whole move is the, the thoughts that are going through your head, right? And in that process, you ultimately ignore your stop loss and the position goes against you and becomes a way bigger loss than you anticipated until you eventually ultimately close it because the dollar value has gotten too big, right? The dollar value has just gotten too big, right? Again, an optional portion of stage three is that because of how you reacted to stages one and two, you oversize your position, you stop out early, right? Which again, I have a feeling that most of us, whether we like it or not, yeah, we, we check, that, check that box on the optional. We're filling out this, uh, this form, giving it to our trading psychologist. I have a feeling most of us were gonna check that box where yeah, we sized up on this during uh, stage three because we were trying to make back what we had missed in stage two, right? Now, there are a variety of different fundamental flaws that I would associate with this stage, but we're starting to see all of them really tie together and starting to see some of the most common psychological issues that pop up with traders. Now, the one that I wanna introduce for stage three that we haven't talked about yet is this idea of overconfidence, right? And there's no doubt that the overconfidence comes from that idea where one, you sold early, but then you sold early and you were still right afterwards. What that will do is instill this certain level of overconfidence in you and essentially, you know, puff up your ego a little bit. It's going to puff up your ego and tell you, you know, hey, you know, you, you're the best, you're one of the best traders. I, you remember that last trade when you sold early and it still ran without you? Come on, it's just a little drawdown. Diamond hands that shit or whatever dumb traders say to themselves when they're trying to hold something, right? But ultimately you ignore your plan completely. Why? Because you have this sense of overconfidence and your ego has come into play, right? Your ego has come into play in a massive, massive way, right? From here, we also see some of our previous fundamental flaws start to resurface. We see that dollar value focus, the dollar value focus this start to resurface, right? Dollar value focuses. Your dollar value focus starts to resurface where your priority becomes on the dollar value, not on your trading plan or your R multiple or your execution, but solely the dollar value up or down, right? And I would say that Pokemon theory also remains pretty prevalent in this stage because in this stage, one of the rays that you talk yourself into holding this trade, right, is the idea that you want to capture that full move that you that you missed last time, right? Last time you went long on NVIDIA at 265, aiming for 270, it got there. And if you would have held for that full move, like Pokemon, you could have run your account to a crazy high score, right? So you talk yourself into holding that position, even though you know and your plan is telling you to bail out, right? So the fundamental flaws that I believe come along with stage three Value dollar value focuses Pokemon theory, but the big one is that sense of overconfidence that comes with ego, right? That comes with your trading ego. And most of the time it's subconscious. Most of the time we as traders, as human beings, aren't like overtly cocky, right? Like most people I know, most students I've worked with, most just people I've like talked to on like Twitter and like Instagram and all the other places. Twitter is a little different. Twitter, people be toxic on that bitch. But 
most traders aren't consciously overconfident, right? Most traders aren't consciously cocky, right? Most traders aren't consciously making bad, like uh, these guys. It, it's all subconscious. It's all, it all comes down to where like, and mind you, you're probably battling in your head that whole time, right? When you're making that decision to hold because of that cockiness, right? You There's still that del angel on your shoulder that's like, dude, just get out of the trade. Just get out, right? Like, this is no, I do not feel good right now, right? So it's a, it's a weird sense of overconfidence, but it's something that we, on, a, on some level, right? It's not like, I don't want to say that it's overt and it's conscious because I, most people I talk to aren't overconfident. They aren't cocky. Most of the time, they've actually had their confidence at a lower level because of something that has happened previously in their trading career, right? So even if you think that you have no ego or you don't suffer from any overconfidence issues, understand that most of the time, it's a silent killer and overconfidence is the type of thing that you won't know that you have until after you've blown the account, right? Then you'll be like, ah, shit, okay, well, I was probably a little bit too cocky on that trade. Well, yeah, did you think? Like, so it's something that I don't want you all to think that like, oh, I'm not cocky, I'm good on that one. I believe I'm one of the more humbler people I know and I still struggle with this on a dramatic level in, in, in some of my trades, right? Now this ultimately leads us into stage four, right? You enter a new trade, it starts to work, but because you are scarred, not scared, but scarred, from the last trades, you watch the PL and immediately close as soon as there's any meaningful dollar value to you, right? The trade again repeats stage one and starts to run without you. And thus you are left with all of our fundamental flaws tying together, leaving you with just like a jumbled up pile of the worst feeling of emotions of all time. It's like that feeling. And I have a feeling some of you might be feeling it today, going into the long weekend, feeling like poop. And I really, sorry for to those of you it happened to today, because it is the worst feeling in the world, right? There's nothing worse than ending a Friday or a Thursday in this case, going into the weekend with like a blown account or feeling like shit, because like literally you just don't want to do anything all weekend. But usually if you have a blown account, in my opinion, it was typically a result of one of the, or all of the loop stages. And it was based off of at least one of these fundamental flaws of trading. Right. So these are the fundamental flaws that I believe that if you can start to identify and correct these in real time, then it becomes significantly easier to prevent yourself from ever going into the loop. Right. Like ever. Right. So again, we have PL based decisions, dollar value based decisions are something that I want you all try to try and avoid. Greed, of course, is very, very simple term, very much easier said than done, so to speak. Right. But Suffering from greed is a fundamental flaw, this sense of overconfidence, right? Which leads right into loss aversion, where you ultimately refuse to admit you are wrong on a position, which will come and lead us right into recency bias, where you start to take account of what happened in a previous trade and apply it to what's occurring in a future trade. I, as well as my favorite fundamental flaw, which is Pokemon theory, has several different layers to it, trying to catch them all, trying to capture the entire move, and most importantly, treating your account like a video game where you're only focused on the high score and your ability to restart rather than actually executing well and, and succeeding at this long term, right? So that being said, right, this leads us into stage five, which is, I've been on a Harry, Harry Potter kick lately. Rather than the deathly hollows, I consider this like the deathly cycle, right? Like if you find yourself in the loop, ultimately this is going to be a deathly repetitive cycle for your account, right? You are going to be continuously taking losses, whether it's big loss and small win, big loss, small win, or whether it's a bunch of small losses, death by a thousand cuts, right? Whatever the case may be, it really is rather than the deathly hollows, we got the deathly cycle, right? This loop is the, one of the most difficult things in the world to evade as a trader and to get away from, right? And so in order to do that, let's talk about a few different ways that we can break free, so to speak, of this, right? Uh, actually, before we do that, sorry. Uh, before I do that, I want to, uh, I made this slide kind of like a summary slide. And I like this because it kind of leads you into what the deathly cycle is, right? Stage one, you're selling early and you're focused on those dollar values, which leads you into stage two, where you have a big issue with recency bias 
in your Pokemon theory, right? Where you start to end up trading like a Pokemon video game. Stage three comes from that overconfidence and that dollar value focused again. Stage four, this is really all of above, right? Where you ultimately end up suffering from all of the fundamental flaws that we've talked about, right? And these, this will put you inside of that deathly cycle, right? So let's talk about some solutions to the deathly cycles. Now, I have some new solutions that I'm gonna talk about now. And then I have afterwards some other psychology, psychology advice. Reason being is that again, over the course of the last year, I have done like two or three psychology webinars and then like three or four podcasts and then many more podcasts come that have all been trading psychology focused, right? So that I've already given so much trading psychology advice that it would be hard for me to repeat all of that on this particular webinar, right? Because the solution to the deathly cycle is a combination of what I'm about to tell you and everything we've already covered from a trading psychology perspective, right? Like I mentioned though, I don't want to spend too much more new time with you all covering that stuff because I've talked about it before. Some of you have probably already listened to it. And if you haven't, it's available for you to go listen, right? On my YouTube or yeah, it's all on YouTube or yeah, it's all on YouTube. Yeah, uh, all right. So here are new, this is the way if you're trying to get out of the deathly cycle, if you're trying to get out of this loop, here are some things that you have to do, so to speak, right? Or the, that you have to keep in mind. First is detachment. If you are badly caught in this loop right now, which I know there's a few of you out there. If you are badly caught in this loop, there is no solving the loop until you take some time off. Now, the market happens to be on your side in the that sense that we have a three-day weekend coming up and you're going to have a full three days where even if you wanted to blow some money, the market's not going to be open. Right? I would carry that into all of next week and then come back after that. That gives you eight days it's plus two more, 10 days. That would give you 10 days before you execute another trade. I would say if you're stuck in the deathly loop, you need to go through this detachment phase where you take at least 10 days away from trading, from the charts, from discords, YouTubes, whatever. You need to go away because in the process of that 10 days, what is going to happen is your brain is going to slowly, 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 slowly start thinking less and less about the dollar values that you just left on the table or that you lost or that you're down. And in turn, what that's going to do is make it so that you're less focused on just making those dollars back, right? When you're focused on making those dollars back, historically, that's not going to go well, right? Because then again, you start to be making those dollar-based value, dollar value based decisions, right? So the first step is detachment. First step is you got to get away for a little bit. I know that sounds like generic trading advice, but it matters, right? I don't care what you have to do. I don't care whatever the case may be. If you're badly stuck in the loop, you're taking the next three days off. Then I want you to take the following five trading days, all of next week off. Then you'll have Saturday and Sunday that will give you 10 days before executing a trade. Can you wait 10 days? I think you can wait 10 days. Is the market going to be open 10 days later? Yes. Will the market still be open for another thousand days after these 10 days? Yes. Will you have plenty of time left in your life to trade after these 10 days? Yes. All right. You'll be fine. Take the time off. I promise you, you will come back better. I can assure you, three day long weekend is usually not enough time. One trading day off is usually not enough time. Having a rough Monday through Thursday and then skipping Friday and expecting to come back strong on Monday, usually not enough time. You got to be willing to take some actual time away if you are hoping to break free of this cycle of the loop, right? Now, the second solution that I would say is honestly the power of awareness, right? Just by us having this conversation today, right? One, for those who weren't familiar with the loop, you are now familiar with it. For those who were familiar, but you forgot about it because I haven't talked about it in a year, right? Or you just haven't thought about it specifically, it is now in your brain. It's now a little bit more aware. It's now front and center, right? The loop and having an awareness of that is good. But if you can have an awareness on all of those fundamental flaws that we talked about, that is going to significantly, significantly, significantly improve your chances of getting out of the loop and getting out of your tough trading psychology 
a little uh, tough trading psychology. Like when you're, I'm trying to blank on the word, but when you're stuck in a rut, right? If you're hoping to get out of that rut, the power of awareness will literally do, I, in my opinion, will, will do wonders for you as a whole, right? Meaning, right? <clears throat> okay, Jake, we've talked about it now. You've put it into my awareness. How do I know that I'm not going to go through this again on Monday or on Tuesday of next week? Who's to say that this is going to stay in the front of my awareness? Okay, that's a valid point, right? In order to keep it in the front of your awareness, what I would like you to do is start writing down some handwritten rules that you have for trading. And in the email that we send out to you all, I'm going to include the slides to this webinar as well as, um, I don't know if I'm, excuse me, I don't know if I'm gonna include this. I think we should include, I don't know if we're gonna get the slides up, but you're gonna get it the recording. But I'm also gonna include my trading rules, a PDF of them so that you can see what mine are, right? But I want you to handwrite yours. There's no as much as it sounds guru, oh, handwriting, working your brain better. I still keep handwritten shit next to me. Like I want you to handwrite down your trading rules. And when you handwrite it down, what I would also like you to do is handwrite down these stages of the loop, right? Because if you can write down the stages of your loop, it becomes in your peripheral vision and it starts to keep that power of awareness, right? You start to become more aware where you might be in a trade and look at your trading rules and all of a sudden see stage two and be like, oh shit, I'm in stage two right now. Skirt! I got to get the hell out of here. You got to back up and get away from your desk as quick as possible so you don't do some dumb shit, right? Having it there handwritten down, I believe will do you absolute wonders uh, uh, for, your, for your trading success, right? Now, the last suggestion that I'm going to have for solutions to getting out of the deathly cycle is an accountability partner. Now, most of the time, I actually don't recommend another trader. Um, I actually recommend someone who doesn't <clears throat> trade, right? And so the most popular person that people would use is like their spouse, right? Like, or, or their partner or a best friend of theirs who doesn't trade or just a general friend of theirs who doesn't trade. You can have an accountability partner who's another trader. But what I have found is that for example, there was a period where I, I moved back in with my parents, right? As soon as I went full time, the first thing I did is I moved back in with them for a few months, saved up some cash. It was fucking great, right? My dad was making me food all the time. It was fucking epic, right? But the other thing I was doing is I was telling my mom everything that happened from a trading perspective. I was like, I did this this day. And I had to tell her one day, I was like, mom, like I fucked up and I lost like 20 grand today, right? And at the time I was trading with some size, but she like looked at me and the, the look that she gave me was kind of like, huh? Like, what the fuck? Right, like I mean, if, you, if I was talking to another trader at the time, another trader might have told me, another trader might have been like, "Well, you know what, Jake, you were up because I was up a lot the month that I took that loss." The other trader might have been like, "Dude, you were up a lot. You know, it'll happen. You know, it happens in that." My mom's like shook reaction, and, and so and her being like, "Jake, what the fuck?" was the thing that ultimately hit me. I was like, "Okay, you know what." I needed to take a, couple, a few days off before I do something stupid. And I actually withdrew my a huge chunk of my 2021 big run profits, which I believe kept me safe into the tricky beginning of tricky beginning of 2022 was a tricky trading year or tricky trading like time, right? It was when we were shifting trend from massively bullish to neutral to bearish, right? That shift, I had been trading with a size down account. And I believe that I sized down my account because of my mom's reaction, aka somebody who is not a trader, right? She didn't try and justify, she didn't try, we didn't discuss, she was just like, huh, you lost how much today, dude? Like, that just seems way out of your risk tolerance. That's a crazy amount of money. Like, she was kind of like, as soon as she was like, that just doesn't, that seems like way bigger of a loss than you should have been taking, right? And she didn't even want to know anything about, oh, well, I was like, yeah, well, I averaged, like, I don't care, right? And so I think that there's some level of positivity that you can get from an accountability partner who isn't a fellow trader. So that would be one thing that I would recommend to you all is find somebody that you can be totally and blatantly honest with every single day. Because the other thing that that will help you do in your brain, right? The other thing that that will help you do in your brain is when you're in the trade, right? If you start to think about averaging down or start to think about doing some dumb shit, if you know that you're going to go home and have to tell your spouse about that, right? And you know that every day you check in about your trades and every day all that, yeah, you're probably going to make the good decision, 
right? And yeah, one out of 10 times, you'll make the smart decision and then the trade will work without you. And it would have worked out if you had averaged down and you would have made more money or whatever the case may be, right? But that'll happen a few times. Out of the majority, the majority of times, you'll be happy following your rules, right? So for my solutions to the deathly cycle, in terms of ones that I haven't preached to you already in previous psychology lessons, first would be detachment. Second would be the power of just this conversation as a whole and the awareness of these stages of the loop. Next would be having those handwritten rules so that you can really start to keep yourself accountable and tangible. For, you don't have to handwrite. You can print and laminate if you want, whatever the case may be, but I want it printed out, right? Not some the Word document. And then I want you to have an accountability partner, preferably one who does not trade, right? If you can do all of those things, I think that you're putting yourself in a pretty good position to avoid extended periods of the loop. You're always gonna have stage one and stage two that's hit. What you need to try and avoid is going into stage three, right? And having these four things in place, I believe can help you avoid going into stage three. Now, beyond that, I actually have a ton of other training psychology advice. However, like I mentioned, I have given this all previously in previous webinars and they're all posted, right? So for example, if you go onto my YouTube channel, you'll be able to find uh, a charity traders webinar in which I take you through my seven in-depth sort of anchoring phrases, right? That help me uh, from a psychological perspective, right? Now, while I don't wanna go through each of these ones individually right now, because I, I don't think that would be a great use of our time for those who had already seen it, right? Because I know that webinar was not too long ago. I do think it would be good for us to go through very briefly what each of these means and how they can help control your trading psychology, right? Um, so we'll do these very briefly. And then the, uh, the next few slides, I'm gonna make sure to send everybody these so we can all have covered. We're going to cover an NVIDIA chart and then I'll let you get through to your weekend and enjoy yourself because I know, you know, eventually you might get a little bit sick of hearing my, uh, my voice rant about trading psychology. So first again, I have these seven uh, or there should be six anchoring phrases. And again, I go through these in depth in that charity webinar that is posted on my YouTube. So we're not going to go through super in depth, but I basically want to give you the gist or a quote from each of them that will help you sort of recognize them because honest these seven anchoring phrases are probably like the thing that helped trader turn around my trading psychology is because i have these seven phrases that i think of and that help remind me to follow my trading rules right so the first one is this phrase of accepting the risk and basically what this means is am i really cool with taking this plan Bucks. AK, if you plan to lose $100 on a trade, are you really cool with losing that $100? Or when you're down 60, are you going to be freaking out because you did not want to do that? Like subconsciously, you really didn't think it would actually get down there, right? So the first anchoring phrase that I want you all to think of is, am I really cool with taking this planned loss, right? The second one is being a good sport. The simple way to think about this is not getting cocky after wins sad after losses, right? Essentially making sure that you are maintaining that neutrality after a winning trade or after a losing trade, right? Next is who's the boss ultimately kind of translates into do I feel obligated to trade every day, right? And if you do feel obligated to trade every day, you need to take a step back and reevaluate your goals and priorities as a trader, right? Next, we have two out of seven, which is, am I comfortable trading or okay, putting this on only two out of seven days? Right, this is a big thing that I preach. This is probably my favorite of all psychology pillars, which is, am I comfortable putting on risk only two out of every seven days, right? The market is choppy most of the time, right? You should not be expecting to put on a significant amount of risk or make a bunch of money on most days. And the number that I've found to be relatively accurate is two out of about every seven trading days, not two a week, but two out of every seven trading days, um, I would be expected to be putting risk on, right? And if you're not comfortable with that, AKA you want to be more of a degenerate than that, 
and put risk on more frequently, you need to find a new career because trading is not that job, right? It's not that guy, right? And we have the one versus 99%, which is can I reverse engineer their mistakes, right? I asked myself on this one, when yeah. right? I asked myself here, can I reverse engineer, right? What the 99% of people who are doing that are failing, can I reverse engineer their mistakes to ultimately be profitable and consistent, right? And then the last one that always sticks in my head is, and I'm using myself as an example right now, just because I have a feeling some of you might look to me as this role, but you can use any trader that you look up to at a role, right? And you ask yourself the question, WWGD, right? Essentially, what would this goat do, right? Would they do this? If they were over there watching my shoulder right now, would they want me participating in this trade? Would they want me doing this? And if the answer is no, you probably shouldn't do that trade, right? You probably shouldn't be doing that, right? So essentially here, and let me try and get these texts so that they actually line up. Here we go, right? First, these, so these anchoring phrases to me, again, we have the deeper presentation on them, but for me, what they do is allow me to have, it's exactly what it sounds like. They anchor me. When I have a moment and you all know what I'm talking about, when you're trading psychology, whether you're in, in the loop or whether it's just maybe the first stages of it, or maybe even just something, an idea running through your head, Right. Whenever you start to feel like you're like uncomfortable in a position or you can see, feel yourself going down a bad road, you can feel yourself ignoring your stop or getting ready to take a loss, whatever the case may be, being able to look and call upon these anchoring phrases to anchor you and bring you back to what you should be doing, I think will ultimately save you countless headaches in your trading psychology career and ultimately keep you out of the loop right? That's what we want to do above all else is we want to make sure to keep you out of the deathly cycle that is the loop, right? That is our priority above, 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 above all else, right? So now the last thing that I would like to do today before I let you all go is dive into the charts a little bit and just talk about the loop and how it could potentially have hit somebody with all four stages in one trade today. And my manager is calling me during a webinar. I'm going to kill him. One of my team members is on. Would you please tag Callan and tell him he's fired? I love you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so let's do this final thing here where we're going to take these stages. We're going to go into our chart right here. And with NVIDIA in and of itself, You can actually see today all four stages having played out, right? So let's say that I don't know. I'm just I'm spitballing. I'm pulling this example out of the back of my uh, back of my ass or whatever the phrase is, right? But let's say you were taking an Nvidia 265 bounce. I don't know if we theorized about this one earlier. You're taking an Nvidia 265 bounce, targeting 270. Right? That's your trading plan. That's what you're looking for. NVIDIA starts to bounce at 265. You enter the position. It starts to work. It starts to go up. And for whatever reason, you don't, maybe you don't sell up here, right? But it starts to pull back and you start to get scared. You watch your PL, right? Because remember, you're staring at your phone at Thinkorswim Mobile. At your PL as this is happening, right? You're staring at it and you watch it go from up 125% to plus 30%. You watch that move happen. You watch it. You watch the money go poof, magic. It's gone, right? So maybe you hold to this first green candle, but once it fails, whatever happens, you get so frustrated, you get annoyed, and you close that position, right? You're still happy. You're up 30%, right? But you close the position. And you just say, hey, I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to take my 30%. You can't go broke taking profits. I'm up 30%. I'm a happy camper, right? 
Then stage two comes into play where the trade starts to make this move without you, right? And that 30% you were up was great, but all of a sudden the same contracts that you were up 30% on have now hit your target. They've now hit your target and they're up 300%, 500%, whatever the case may be. And next thing you know, it could have been an account, account changing trade for you. You know, you risked 1%, you could have made 25% in one trade, something like that. Right. And you're feeling some crazy FOMO. Right. Usually what will happen is that you will ignore a re-entry right here. You'll ignore a re-entry right here. But once it hits your target and once you were right, right, once you were right. Again, that's the key thing we talk about. Not only did you sell early, but you sold early and you were right. Right. That's the part that fucks with your brain. As soon as we hit 270 and you were right, you start thinking, well. Maybe we go to 275 today. Maybe we could go to all the way up to 280s today. I, I don't know. The sky is the limit. I was right before. I'm probably going to be right again. So, okay, you say wait. And let's say even you wait for an, you wait for a setup to trigger. You wait for a one, two, three pattern. You wait for some sort of higher low. And guess what? You do indeed get it. Right there, there's a valid reason to enter this trade based on the system that I use right there. Now, I personally wouldn't have taken it because I believe NVIDIA was way too extended, but there's a valid reason to have entered that trade and keep a stop right below these lows, right? But, I mean, valid reason for someone who's thinking logically to keep a stop below those lows. Are you thinking logically? No, you're in stage three. Right, where you have this sense of overconfidence and you're focused on the dollar value. Now, another optional part of stage three that we talked about, right? Again, if you go back here, optional. An optional part of stage three is that you oversize in order to make up lost dollars. Right. So here, for example, right, we talked about it in the original stage three, right? The optional portion was after seeing how much you left on the table on that earlier trade, aka after seeing the 300 or 400% that it ran, not only do you decide to re enter, but you use bigger size. Why? Well, you're just trying to make however much you were up. You missed out on $600. I'm trying to make that 600. So I'm just going to use a little bit of a bigger position size. No worries, Jake. No worries. I have a tight stop loss. <clears throat> stop loss triggers and hits. <clears throat> and that is where our stage three really comes into play, right? You decide to ignore your stop. Why do you decide to ignore your, ignore your stop? The overconfidence and ego, right? The ego comes into play and the dollar value. The fact that you had so much risk on this trade because you were trying to make back what you lost, right? because you're trying to make back what you lost, right? And ultimately, or not lost, you're trying to make back what you, uh, what you thought should have been yours, right? And ultimately you end up having to hold through a huge drawdown, right? You have to hold up through a huge drawdown and then right as it gets to here, you're like, you know what, fudge! All of a sudden I've hit my max loss on the day. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. Even though, for some delusional reason, you know, maybe you could have potentially looked to have held this trade using this as a higher low or for whatever chart structural reason, you know, oh man, there's that optional part of stage three that we talked about, right? Optional part of stage three is the oversized, so you stop out early and then the trade works without you, right? The trade ultimately ends up coming right back to where it does without you. And next thing you know, you have a blown account and it all, it all started because of the fact, it all started because of the fact that you closed the position early and had massive FOMO from it. Next thing you know, you've yeeted a port, you've blown a port and it's all, all gone, right? So the reason I use this example 
in particular is one, it was today, right? And two, it goes to show that the loop does not discriminate. The loop can attack traders in a one day span, right? In one day, you can go through all several stages of the loop and blow an account, right? Or this could be the kind of thing that gets dragged out over a week or two or a month long period, right? Like I said, it does not discriminate until you start to take the steps that we talked about to breaking the deathly cycle, you will be stuck in the deathly cycle, right? You will be stuck in this loop. And I highly, 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 highly recommend above any of the other psychology things that we've talked about today, my biggest piece of advice for anyone who feels like they are stuck in the loop right now is you have, to, I'm giving you the game plan. Here's the game plan. You spend the next three days that when the market is closed doing vacation things or weekend things, going out with friends, going out with family, go, go smoke a joint. I don't care. Whatever. Then next week you spend the full week doing like real life shit. You work your job. You, I don't know. If you're a full-time trader and you're going through this, then you take another week of vacation, whatever. I don't know, right? Or you look into a second source of income that you have, whatever the case may be. But you take the entirety of next week off. And then you take the weekend to hang out with friends and get attached. And then you come back. That's stage one to getting out of the deathly cycle. That's my biggest piece of advice or takeaway for any of you who have been struggling. All right? With that being said, my friends, truthfully, that is all I have for you today. Honestly, like I said before, I just fairly recently have done a lot of trading psychology talks when it comes to the webinar, when it comes to the podcast, all that. So I didn't really know how this was going to go because I wanted, like I said, I always on these, I want to make sure that I come and deliver like a crazy, crazy, crazy amount of value, right? And so I really hope that you're walking out of this one feeling like you have a better understanding of how to handle your trading psychology as a whole, right? I genuinely hope that that is the takeaway uh, that everyone has from this, right? So with that being said, I did get a DM before this and someone's like, oh, are you going to be talking about your mastermind on the webinar? And I was like, no, not really, because it, it, I'm not, it's not, so I'm trying to just give this psychological value. But if you have any questions about that, just DM me. I'm around all day, so I'll be answering all of my DMs on Instagram. Just feel free to shoot me a DM uh, and I'll be able to answer, help, help answer any questions uh, that you might have about that. If this is what I do in a, uh, a free tra trading webinar, I can promise you that the, uh, the mastermind classes go significantly more in depth with the same and even higher levels of energy. So with that being said, I hope you all have an amazing long weekend. I hope you have a great time detaching from the charts. This recording will probably take some time to process, but we'll send it out to you as soon as we can. All right. All right. Cheers, everybody. I love you all so, so much. Go smoke a joint for me. Okay. I'm going to do the same damn thing and spark this blunt. I love you all. Have a great day.